Amen, amen. Thank you, Mark. Man, I don't know about y'all, but worship was fantastic this morning. Like, I'm ready to like charge into battle, run through a brick wall. Like I'm ready. Um, but thank you for being here this morning. My name is Garrett McCord, and I'm the youth pastor here at FBC Bernie. And so to go ahead and start us off, last year I had the privilege of getting to go on our Yucatan mission trip. And we're actually leaving for this year's trip a week from tomorrow. So if you would go ahead and pray for us, we're going to pray for the team next week. Um, but I have one memory that I, I remember very, very vividly. And last year, as we were flying back from the trip, we were flying through the Cancun airport, which if you've ever flown out of the airport, you know it's a very nice airport. It's a step up from San Antonio, which is basically like one long hallway with a Whataburger, right? It's a nice hallway, but it's a hallway. And so I'm an explorer too. So with new places, you'd think I'm, I'm so thrilled. I'm going to check out everything that this terminal has to offer. I'm going to use every benefit. I'm going to sit at every gate. I'm going to use every plug. I'm going to go to Starbucks and spend $20 on a small burnt coffee and a muffin, but it's okay because it's Cancun Starbucks. It's cool, right? I want to squeeze every benefit out of this terminal. I want to see everything. You know what? I might go through security twice because I like this little spinny thingy. I just want to experience everything. But what actually happened is that I made a beeline straight for the gate and waited for our flight. Why? Well, because that year, uh, and, and now as well, I had a beautiful wife who was waiting at home for me. I had a little one-year-old girl waiting at home for me. I've been gone for a week. I've, I've been gone over Father's Day. And you know when you have that newborn, the first one especially, you're gone for like more than three hours. You're like, what if she forgets me? Like, I'm gonna, she's not going to know my name. And I wanted to get home to be with them. I didn't get distracted with the terminal because I didn't want to have any chance of missing my flight and therefore missing my destination. Because the destination mattered more than my enjoyment of the journey. Why am I telling you this? Well, because we live in a world today that's going to tell you the opposite. It's all about the journey. If you can just gather up a bunch of stuff, a bunch of money, get a nice car, get a nice house, maybe a boat, if the lakes ever have water in them to use it, right? Get all your stuff, right? If you can get some success, if you can get some power, maybe get some letters behind your name, have a really nice desk, a little nice corner office, have people that answer to you meet all of your desires, your sexual desires being filled. Like if you can just do all that, then you'll be living the good life because the experience of the journey is so great. The problem is there's so much focus on the journey that the world is selling you that not many people have stopped to think about where it's taking you, where that destination is. And we live in a culture where there's actually fewer social restrictions and taboos than ever. And I know it doesn't feel like it right now because of the uh, inflation and things, but big picture, we actually have more wealth and access accessibility than ever. So in theory, we're more free to enjoy the journey than ever before. So in theory, practically, we should be more happy than ever, right? Wrong. Statistic after statistic shows that that's not the case. The World Happiness Report says that several Western countries have experienced a decline in happiness scores. In fact, the United States over the past decade has dropped from 13th to 19th. And in the U.S., the percentage of adults experiencing major depressive episodes has increased from 6.7% in 2005 to 8.4% in 2020. And among adolescents, this rate is even higher with over 15% experiencing major depressive episodes in recent years. And in the UK, it's not just the US, in London, right, there's been a significant increase in mental health problems among young people, with 70% of 18 to 24-year-olds reporting mental health issues in 2020 alone. And we've seen the effects downstream, right? We've seen a massive increase in substance abuse to try and medicate away these issues. For instance, in the United States, the NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, reported that rising overdose deaths, uh, or that reported that overdose deaths are rising with synthetic opioids, primarily fentanyl, being the leading cause. And in 2021, overdose deaths in the states surpassed 100,000 for the first time. And there's no demographic that's been affected worse by these trends than our young people. Right? The United States, the CDC reported a significant rise in suicide rates among adolescents with a 60% increase from 2007 to 2018. And the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare highlighted that one in seven children and adolescents aged 14 to 17 experienced a mental disorder in 2020-2021. Something 
isn't right. We've been sold a lie. The path that our society is on, the, the good life, live it up, enjoy the journey, is not leading us where we want it to. Living your best life, squeezing everything you can out of that terminal is not actually leading to the good life. It's leading to destruction. And we need a new path. We need a new way, a way that leads to life, life to the fullest. And so this morning, we're going to look to the words of Jesus to find that path. If you have your copies of God's word, please open up to Matthew chapter 17, starting in verse, or chapter 7, starting in verse 13. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, that is going to be in the pew back in front of you. Uh, and so if you don't have one, that is yours to keep. That's your gift. Highlight in it, mark it up, underline it. Please keep that uh, as yours. And so as you flip there, just some context, the text that we're going to be in this morning comes at the end of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And many of you are probably familiar with the Sermon on the Mount. It's really this collection of Jesus' teachings, and it almost serves as kind of like a greatest hits, right? You, you see all of these things that you've probably heard of before. You have the Beatitudes, where Jesus is describing who is in the kingdom. What is God going to transform you into as you follow him? You have his teaching on uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You have his teaching on being salt and light, on fleeing anger, fleeing lust, Loving your enemies, giving to the needy, not being judgmental. You have the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. You have the golden rule. It goes on and on and on. But we're actually going to be at the end of the sermon this morning. And at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus actually gets very, very pointed to the point where a lot of people kind of like to leave this part out. But he gives a challenge. He challenges those who just heard him teach all of this. He challenges them to respond. He makes it clear that, hey, it's not just enough to hear all of these things and, and mentally agree, but, but my call demands an answer. And he does so by painting a picture, and this picture is two ways of life. There's a broad way, and there's a narrow way. And they each have their own gate, and they each have their own destination. One to life, and one to destruction. <clears throat> and so let's go ahead and read. Starting in verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. We just take a moment to bow your heads. And I would love for you to just take a moment to pray for your heart. Would you pray that God would open your eyes to see his word? That the Holy Spirit would speak to you? That he would move in your life? That he would show you areas that you need to press into and surrender to him? That he would remove any distractions? And would you pray for me that I would be able to preach his word faithfully and that this would be helpful to you? Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning and to read your word, to learn from it, God. Would you help us to see your truth? Holy Spirit, would you speak to us? Would you move in the way that only you can? And would you bring us from, uh, from, from death to life this morning even? God, we love you and we praise you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And so the first of these two paths is the broad path. Meaning this path is wide, and Jesus isn't just trying to emphasize the literal width of the path, but he's describing the experience of traveling it. This broad path with no boundaries is easy to go down. Right? And this is the way of the world. You get to fit in. You get to go with the flow. It's not really any obstacles or boundaries or anything of that nature. Nobody really cares that much about what you do. And what he's doing is he's saying, hey, there's a way of going through life that's easy. You get to believe what you want to believe. You get to do what you want to do. Chase your pleasure. Chase your money. Chase your status. Chase your accomplishments. And like we said in the beginning, this is the culture's lie of stay true to yourself. Do what makes you happy. Live your best life. Soak everything you can out of the journey of life. Who cares where it takes you? But what's just the most absolutely amazing thing is how Jesus is actually putting his finger on what we talked about in the introduction right here, thousands of years ago. That road leads to destruction. You can live a life full of pleasure, full of comfort, full of ease, and think you have it made. But each day, you're just sleepwalking, just getting one step closer to separation, one step further away from life, from God. It's kind of like the Lord of the Rings, 
Let me explain. Anybody seen the Lord of the Rings trilogy? Anybody in here? A few of us? All right. So I believe it's in the third movie. Uh, Frodo is given the task of destroying this ring. If it's not in the third movie, movie sincerely apologize. Uh, email me afterwards. I'm sure I'll get one. But he has the task of destroying this ring because this ring is enslaving the land. And so he sets out on this journey and he's got to go to this place called Mount Doom. And if you couldn't tell by the name, the path to Mount Doom is not easy. There's obstacles, there's difficulties, there's all these things that are going to get in the way. And at this one point, they get to a crossroads, and there's two paths in front of them. There's an easy path and a hard one. And the easy one's tempting because it's easy. It's familiar, it's much, much safer, but the problem with this path is that it takes them further away from their mission. It takes them further away from the mountain. So while in the short term it's going to be easier, it would ultimately lead to failure. It would ultimately lead to destruction because it's getting further away from the destination. And they ultimately choose the difficult path because even though it would require great suffering, great sacrifice, it would be more difficult. By choosing that narrow, difficult path, they were really choosing salvation, peace, and life, even though it would be more difficult to get there. Do you see it? In the same way in our lives, just like Frodo and Sam, we have a choice. And there's always a temptation to choose immediate comfort and immediate ease. And while it might seem tempting, the truth is that that path is from Satan himself. It's a lie as old as time. Because you have an enemy, and that enemy's entire focus is to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to take you out. He wants to take your marriage out. He wants to take your family out. And the scary thing that we don't realize is he doesn't really need to possess you or get you to commit adultery or murder to get you to do it. He just has to distract you. C.S. Lewis writes about it in his book, The Screwtape Letters. And in this book, he's writing from the perspective of a senior demon to a junior demon, and they're conversing on how to tempt man, how to lead him astray. I'll have these quotes up on the screen because it's a little bit long. But he writes to the junior demon this, your job as a tempter is to keep the patient from the serious intention of praying altogether. The best way to do this is by encouraging them to think about anything other than God and their own soul. A distracted Christian is one of our best allies. And he continues, he says, prosperity knits a man to the world. He actually feels that he's finding his place in it while really it is finding its place in him. His increasing reputation, his widening circle of acquaintances, his sense of importance, the growing pressure of agreeable work build in him a sense of being really at home in earth, which is what we just want. And then he ends with this, but do remember the only thing that matters is the extent to which you separate the man from the enemy. And by enemy, he means God. It does not matter how small the sins are, provided that their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and into the nothing. Murder is no better than cards if cards will do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one. The gentle slope, the soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. This is what Jesus is warning you about. The danger of the broad path is not necessarily a hard life. The danger of the broad path is an easy one. One that's so easy that you sleepwalk through life, never actually seeing your desperate need for salvation. Right? And we see this in, in our culture, in our world, in our affluent society so much because we don't have a whole lot of felt needs. I know that's not everybody's experience, But relative to the vast majority of the rest of the world, we've got it made. It's really easy to trick yourself into thinking, I don't really need God. Got my 401k, I have some kids, I have a wife, I have food on my table, I have a job that's pretty much recession-proof. You know, we're, we're doing great. Jesus says you can't get so distracted by the journey that you don't see the direction you're headed. The danger is that you get so consumed with the things of the world, passions, pleasures, that you have no idea that you're actually headed for destruction. And so ask yourself this morning, are you on the broad path? Are you living a life of distraction? Are you going to wake up in 20 years and realize that the entire kingdom of comfort and pleasure and ease that you've built around yourself has been built on sand? That you've lived a life that in eternity means absolutely nothing. That's a scary thought. It's one that I wrestle with. 
What fills your heart? What fills your schedule? Is it Jesus? Is it the things of the kingdom? Or is it travel ball? Because ultimately what fills your heart will come out. You'll see it in your life. And that will tell you a lot about your destination. And so obviously Jesus is warning against this broad way, a distracted, meaningless life that is centered on squeezing the most out of this world as possible. But that doesn't actually tell us what is he warning us to. He's warning us away from that, but what is he telling us to do? Where is he calling us to? It's not just enough to call us away from something, but what is the goal? And that's actually the beautiful part of this text, is when you see that, you realize Jesus isn't just beating up on us here. He is standing outside of that road that leads to destruction, saying, I love you, come here. There's no life in that. That's going to take you out. That's going to destroy you. Come over here. I want what's best for you, please. He's calling you to life in himself. And that's what we see in verse 14. So I'm just going to reread it. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. At the beginning of the verse, he says, enter by the narrow gate. And so the second path is the narrow one. This is the path of of following Jesus. And it's completely opposite to the way of the world. It looks totally different. For one, it's narrow. And and what he means by narrow is there are boundaries. Where the broad path has no boundaries, you can believe what you want, you can do what you want. That's not the case here. But the question is, what are the boundaries? Well, John chapter 10, verse 9, Jesus says, I am the gate. See the connection there? Those, Those words in the Greek are actually very close synonyms. They're almost interchangeable. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. And he will go in and out and find pasture. And what Jesus is saying is, I'm the gate. I'm the boundaries. And and at one point, that means that you can't get on the path without going through him first, which means there is no salvation outside of Jesus Christ. You can't get eternal life without first placing your faith in him. But it also means there's boundaries on your beliefs. You don't get to just believe and think whatever you want anymore. You have to align with Jesus. You have to lay down all your presuppositions, your preferences, your prejudices, and you have to pick up his teachings about the universe. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is, right? That is Jesus giving you his worldview, which is the truth. How we as Christians are to view reality around us, this is the most like concise, that's what I love about it. It's the most concise picture of what are we, who are we, what do we live in? He says, you have to pick that up. You don't get to just pick and choose the commands you like. You know, I love the whole, like, don't judge others. I love the whole, like, uh, love your enemies thing, and and especially when I'm the enemy who needs loving. But I'm just going to kind of look over the parts about drunkenness and profanity and lust. That's not how it works. To enter into the narrow gate, you can't take anything with you. It's narrow. You have to surrender. And it's a conscious surrender. Right? Sometimes I think we kind of get in this lie where we think we're just going to stumble on the way. One of my favorite authors has this quote, and it's that there are no accidental saints. You don't stumble into holiness. You have to consciously choose to enter the gate, place your faith in Jesus and what he did for you on the cross, and follow him. And Jesus is honest here. He's not pulling any punches. He's not trying to con somebody in. This isn't, uh, I was actually about to name a mid-level marketing scheme, but I don't know who's in the room. So this isn't a mid-level marketing scheme. I don't want to uh, offend anybody on their personal one of choice, but he's not trying to wrap you into something, right? He's honest. He says, hey, following me is going to be difficult. This is what the narrow road looks like. It requires sacrifice. It requires self-denial. You hear him say it in Mark 8, 34. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And we like to make that verse pretty, but the cross was a torture device. We put that on coffee cups. He's saying, hey, pick up your execution tool and follow me. Die to self. Luke 14, 33 says, so therefore any of you who does not renounce all he has cannot be my disciple. You have to drop everything to join him. There's another verse, I didn't put it in the notes, I had to scratch it, but if anybody looks, uh, sets hand to the plow and looks back, he's not fit for the kingdom of God, meaning that you have to be fully devoted, you have to commit, you have to surrender to him. And the difficulty isn't just within ourselves. It's not just this battle to surrender to yourself. Jesus says in John 15, 18 through 19, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Because if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world and I chose you out of the world, the world hates you. 
The reality is those who are on the narrow path, you don't get to believe what everybody else believes. In fact, you believe the opposite of what the world believes. And you know the one rule on the broad path? Don't tell anybody they're wrong. You know the one rule of truth? Everybody else is wrong. And you're not going to be popular societally for your beliefs. And we're seeing this play out in real time more and more and more each day. For those of you who've kept up with the news lately, you've probably seen the Harrison Bucker situation, and I'm not getting into the details of it. I'm not sitting here making a stance, but lately, uh, there, all the talk has been about this kicker for the Kansas City Chiefs gave a commitment speech at a Catholic university. And he gave a, a speech, and it's been this huge source of controversy. He's received a ton of backlash, and there's obviously some things in the speech that I don't align with. It was a speech to a Catholic commencement. He was speaking to Catholic, uh, Catholics at a Catholic point of view. But a lot of the things that he's receiving backlash for are not Catholic distinctives, but just simply like tenets of Orthodox Christian belief. Like it's just what we believe is Christians, right? Things such as our views on sexuality, abortion, the value of a husband and a father, the value of a wife and a mother who are both submitted to the Lord. But if you open your phone and go to X or Instagram or Reels or some social media site, you would think that Harrison Butker killed somebody and likes to kick puppies. Like you would think this dude like committed the heinousest of heinous crimes. Why? Remember the words of Jesus, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world and because I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. It's not just him. Jack Phillips, you may know the name, that was the case uh, probably about 10 years ago now where he did not want to make a custom cake for an LGBTQ wedding and they went after him. They sued him. They tried to shut him down. And he was acquitted at the Supreme Court. But as I was studying for this, I actually learned that he's back in hot water because he didn't want to make one for a transgender wedding. And then Dan Cathy, the CEO, has gotten backlash multiple times for expressing a Christian view of marriage between one man and one woman. And honestly, I had so many examples for this, I had to cut about 10. They would just pop up more and more and more and more. Because on the narrow path, your beliefs will not be popular. You will face resistance from the world. Part of the difficulty of the path is breaking away from the masses, breaking away from popular opinion. It means holding to the truth, staying and standing in the light, even when people in the darkness hate it. Now, now let me tell you, and I do need to preface it with this, uh, being different, believing the truth is not a license to hate others. It's not a license to beat them down. We're called to love and lovingly call them to truth and call them to life. And so we have to be careful in how we engage with the truth. It is very possible to say the right thing in the wrong way. And that's important. But by holding to the truth... For all of church history, that's led to persecution of some sort. Maybe not necessarily in the church that we've experienced it, but somewhere in the world, there's never been a period where the church has not been persecuted for standing on the truth. Because by choosing Jesus in the narrow path, you are choosing sacrifice and suffering. And so why in the world would you choose it? Now, Garrett, you are doing a really bad job of pitching this idea. Like, this sales pitch is not good. All the sharks are out. We're done. Because listen to Jesus' words. The destination matters more than the journey, like we said earlier. You can choose the easy life, but if it takes you to the wrong place, what was the point? Jesus' words, he points out that even though following him means the gate is narrow and the road is hard, the narrow path is the way that leads to life. That there's no life outside of the path that follows him. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody gets to the Father except through me. There's no other way. And that's the truth. Everybody in the world is on one of these two paths. There's no third path where you kind of live a moral life and do happy, good things, and then God kind of lets you in at the end just because you're a really nice guy. Like, no, it's broad way that leads to destruction, narrow way that leads to life. Everybody is on one of the two. And the broad path offers death through fake freedom. You ride your independence all the way to separation with God. Separation from God. And that's what the world is seeing now. Because when we're free from any sort of authority, any sort of structure, we always become a slave to ourselves. Become a slave to our flesh, our most animal, sinful desires. And it puts us in a place where we can't love because we're drowning in selfishness. 
We can't serve because we have no self-control. It always leads to slavery. But the narrow path offers true freedom through narrowness. True freedom through death to self. And we know that this is possible. My married brothers and sisters in the room, you've seen it. What do I mean? Well, did you guys know that every wedding is also a funeral? What do I mean by that? (laughs) You can tell the people who are married. You know. (laughs) means when you stand on that platform and you share your vows with your spouse, future spouse, in front of all your family and friends, that old you dies. He's gone. That independent, do whatever you want, say whatever you want, think whatever you want, that guy ain't coming back. Lord willing. And this happens kind of slowly because the honeymoon's great, you get back, you realize, man, life is going to look a little bit different. Right, guys, we've all made the phone call. Hey, babe, uh, Matt, Matt invited me to go play golf and Oh, oh, we, we made plans to walk around home goods. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I totally, I totally remembered that. Um, yeah, I would, I would love that. So, like, like, I can't do that, like, not tomorrow. No, 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 you're right, not tomorrow, not tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll call Matt. Bye, bye. You've all made it. Ladies, you didn't think that your life was going to be fighting for attention on Saturdays with College Game Day and Kirk Herbstreet. Any ladies in here, Kirk Herbstreet's been a lot bigger part of your marriage than you thought? Anybody? So why do we do this? Why why are we not just standing at every wedding venue in town, 25 mile radius, just standing at the door like, don't do it. You don't want it. Turn around, trust me. (laughs) Why? Because by imposing the boundaries and restrictions of marriage, you get access to true freedom and life and the intimacy of marriage. Let me say that again. By imposing boundaries and restrictions of marriage, you get access to true freedom and life and the intimacy in marriage. You get to be one with someone else. You get to share all of life together. There's a trust between you and that person that cannot exist outside of that covenant. And if you don't surrender your right to spend what you want, flirt with who you want, that marriage isn't going to go well. It's not going to lead to life. Your marriage will be as healthy as you are willing to die to yourself. And that principle is the same in in life. The only way to eternal life is through death to self, freedom through narrowness. Tim Keller puts it this way. He says, we see that freedom is not what the culture tells us. Real freedom comes from a strategic loss of some freedoms in order to gain others. It's not the absence of constraints, but it's choosing the right constraints and the right freedoms to lose. And one of my favorite uh, authors, you can check, quotes John Mark Comer off your Garrett preaching bingo card. So he adds this, he says, the ultimate example of this is love. Is there a greater constraint than a loving relationship? To gain intimacy, we have to give up autonomy. As a mentor said to me just the other day, intimacy only resides in the safety of commitment. And so when Jesus calls you away from a life of comfort and ease, It's not because he wants to make you miserable. It's because he loves you. He sees the end of that road, even when we can't. When we're so blinded by our own desires, by our addiction to immediate gratification, he sees the end of the road. And he's sitting there on the narrow path calling you, come to me, come to me. I want to set you free. I want you to see life. Stop holding on to all these lesser things that are going to take you out. Drop all of them. Come to me and let me save you. Let me redeem you. So the question is, do you trust him? Do you trust him fully enough to, or do you trust him enough to fully surrender? Because for a lot of people, guys, you know, they don't reject God because they can't scientifically or philosophically believe in his existence. It's not that science has disproved God, but it's they either can't or don't want to believe that he is good and that all of his commands are either for our good or to keep us from harm. They think he's holding out on them. He's a buzzkill. He doesn't want me to live my best life. And sometimes this presents as, okay, I'll take some Jesus. Or I'll take just a little bit of church, maybe a little bit of grace. But the second that his will comes into conflict with mine, he asks me to drop something, to start something, to give something away. Yeah, I'm out. I'm jumping ship because I don't trust him that much. I'll give him a little bit of my life. The parts I don't really care about, if I'm being honest, but the stuff I want to do, I'm keeping that back. But once we see that that, that that's not going to lead us to life, then we're able to step out in freedom. And very few would actually say those words, but our lives show it. And so my question for you this morning is, do you believe that he's good? Does your life reflect that you believe he's good? 
Because it's one thing to say it, it's another way, or it's another thing to live it. Because true belief in God's goodness will always lead to surrender and obedience. And that's what Jesus hammers home in the last verse of this passage. Verse 21, if you go ahead and skip down there. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And man, if this isn't one of the scariest passages in all of Scripture, and and Jesus meant for it to be intense, what he's saying is, hey, not everybody who thinks they're on the narrow path is. He says, many will find the broad path, few will enter by the narrow gate. How can so many people be mistaken? How can, you, how can you live a life where you get to the end and you stand before Lord and you try to show him what you did and he says, I never knew you? Well, I think for a lot of us, it's because we try to enter the gate the wrong way. Some of us think we're born into it. That I, was, I was born on the narrow path. My grandparents were Christians. My parents were Christians. I was, uh, went to church before I was born all nine months. Every time the doors are open... Others, we think we can get in through intellectual prowess. Like, we know enough. I, I'm orthodox enough. I have enough right belief. I know tulip, dispensationalism, all the things. For some, it's passion and zeal. I'm going to be there as much as I can. I'm going to be fired up. I'm going to be the most expressive in worship. I'm going to do all of these things for Jesus. Other, it's works. I'm going to do great things. I'm going to go serve. I'm going to go do all of this stuff. And none of that is bad. But the problem is, Jesus doesn't ask for any of it to enter the gate. That's all a part of the narrow path, but it doesn't get you through the gate. Because these people that are told to depart, they've prophesied, they cast out demons. Any of us cast out demons before? They've done things in the name of Jesus. But he doesn't need that from you on the front end. We don't enter the gate by knowledge, works, passion, or bloodline. We enter the gate through surrender that leads to relationship. Let me say it again. We don't enter the gate by knowledge, works, passion, or bloodline. We enter the gate through surrender that leads to relationship. Romans 5, 6 through 9 says, For we will, for while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to even die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The truth of the gospel is that we're broken beyond our own repair. That there's something deep inside of us that's fractured. That even the apparent good we do has tainted motives. Right? We're like a mint where the mold is broken. We do nothing but pump out dirty and misrepresented and misshapen coins. We need more than just some good works. We need more than just some knowledge. We need more than just a Christian family. We need a heart transformation from the inside out. Jesus isn't asking you to put on your hiking boots and hike up the mountain of the narrow path to the city of God. That's not his call here. In fact, he never says, hey, walk the path. What does he say at the beginning of the verse? Enter the narrow gate. What Jesus is asking you for is to come to him with nothing but your own sin and your own inadequacy in your hands. And say, Lord, I've tried. I've done everything I can. I've tried to earn it. I've tried to work my way out of my sin. I've tried to change myself and I can't do it. I need you to change me. I need you to take me off this path to destruction that I'm on. And scripture says that he is faithful just. If we confess us of our sins, he would forgive us. That if we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that we would be saved. That if we would trust in what he did for us on the cross, the fact that we had earned God's wrath because of our sin. God is just and he has to punish sin. No amount of good we do wipes away the bad we've done. So God took that wrath and he put it on his own son, Jesus. The one person to have ever earned eternity got death because of what we had done. 
so that if you would come to him at the foot of the cross, empty-handed, lay down your effort, lay down the pride, lay down the religion that you grew up with and say, Jesus, I need you. You'll be saved. You'll enter through the narrow gate. And the beautiful thing is, once you enter through the gate, the destination is secure. Scripture says that you will be adopted, redeemed, saved, chosen. And so that doesn't make the path easy. So if you entered through the gate 20 years ago and have found it to be much more difficult than you expected, be encouraged. Because what happens is after we enter through the gate, we place our faith in Jesus. For the rest of our lives, God is lovingly peeling back layer and layer and layer of sin, of idolatry, of pride, you name it, slowly shaping us more into the image of Christ. And so the narrow path is not about what you can get out of the journey, but what Jesus can get into you along the way as he shapes you more and more into somebody who has love, peace, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, the fruits of the Spirit. He shapes you into the Beatitudes. He shapes you into somebody who doesn't just recite and try to memorize the Sermon on the Mount, but lives it out, embodies it. We all desire to be that, right? I hope you do. We want that peace. We want that freedom. We want to be that type of person of love. And as we walk along the narrow way, the Holy Spirit shapes us and leads us. We don't have to do it on our own. And so as we close, I want to leave a chance for reflection. There should be pads in front of the, in the pew back in front of you. Uh, And I just want you to take that. And as we sing this last song in response, I just want you to think about, have you entered the gate? Pray the words of Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in life everlasting. What path are you on? What do you need to surrender? We didn't get to talk much about this, but yes, surrender is a part of entering the gate and receiving eternal life. But along the narrow way, there are constant moments of continual surrender. When God in his love shows you a little bit more of something that he wants to free you of, a little bit more of something you need to lay down so that you can have more of him. So ask yourself, are you in the seat of the people who are told to depart? Living a life of comfort, ease, this kind of veneer or facade of spirituality. And if we're honest, guys, that can get you pretty far in this city. Right? We're blessed to live in, in a place that has Christian leaders and has a Christian culture, uh, but that blessing can soon become a curse when we let that become the end rather than the means. Because being a Christian here can, can get you into the right circles. It can get you support for whatever cause you're trying to push. But Jesus is not a means to the end. He is the end. And there's no life in that type of life. Don't live for the terminal. The most heartbreaking thing of this passage that Jesus taught is that there are many people, the majority of people, who are so busy extracting the benefits of the terminal so much that they're going to miss their destination. Their plane's going to take off and they're going to realize that they missed it because they're living for the world. So I want to leave you with this. Make a beeline for the gate. Make a beeline for the gate to the narrow road where you will experience life and life everlasting. I promise you it's the best decision you'll ever make. You might not have an easy life, but you'll have the good life, I promise. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for your word this morning. And we thank you for the opportunity we get to wrestle with difficult texts and in your teaching, Lord, that this has been preserved for us, that we get to see it and we get to learn more about who you are and and who we are called to be. And then, Father, I pray that as we take this time to reflect and respond, that you would give us a clarity of thought and a clarity of heart to be able to work through what you might need us to see this morning, what you might want to show us. Lord, in all of our hearts, if there's areas that we need to surrender, if there are things that we need to lay down, Lord, would you show us, would you give us the courage and the boldness to do that? And Lord, would you help us Maybe if there's somebody in this room this morning who has never entered through the gate, God, would you just change their heart? Would we see the miracle of salvation from death to life? 
God, we love you. We praise you. We give you all the glory. We thank you that we don't have to walk this path alone, and we thank you that it leads to eternal life, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.